company, Hawkers, had uh, had led the way naturally in um, before the Marines or the Royal Air Force flew from ships in in uh, looking at that use of the aircraft because that was one of the big advantages of VSTOL, especially the vertical landing bit. It meant that you could uh, you could fly from quite austere ships. So we had always felt that there was more development to be done in making, shall we say, a specialised version of the aeroplane to fly from ships, which in the end turned into something called the Sea Harrier. But before that happened, there were uh, a couple of things that are probably worth discussing. The Marine Corps really got heavily into flying from ships and they did very well with it. The sort of modifications that were necessary to fly the aeroplane from ships were negligible. Um, we're talking of adding sort of tie-down areas on the, on the wingtip outriggers and the main wheel and so on because when ships um, operate as floating airfields the only thing that keeps the equipment on the deck is friction between the rubber tyres and the deck and when a ship you know rolls about all over the place or goes through rough water and if you've got sea water and oil and everything else floating around on the deck um, sometimes the friction is not that much and you really need to lash everything down to the deck so the, uh, the, the most significant modification was this need to provide external lashing points there were some small changes necessary to the nav attack system which in those days was quite an early inertial platform system one of those devices that has a stabilized platform has got accelerometers on it in all three axes and if you connect this to, an, to a computer the computer can calculate from the accelerations in the three axes one integration of course will give you velocity and the second integration will give you position and so you could get the accurate position of the aeroplane from one of these inertial platforms. It didn't need any GPS satellites, which hadn't happened then. It didn't need any radio transmissions to come in or go out. It was a totally self-contained thing called an inertial platform. And, uh, and what, a, what a wonderful thing that was for the military at that time. Gave them an unprecedented level of accuracy. Um, I mean, we're talking in those days, in, in the early 70s, we're talking of an accuracy which had a drift of about a mile or a mile and a half per hour. Now you might say, well that's not very accurate, you know, I don't know where I am to an hour, to a mile and a half after an hour. But when you start looking out the, out the side of an aeroplane that's doing four or five hundred knots, you know, a mile is nothing. So for, although today such accuracies will be laughed upon or laughed at, um, and, and were no good for weapon aiming as such, uh, they were excellent for pilot navigation, I mean, better than anything we'd ever had. So these inertial platforms have to be aligned, and, and this process can take, which means sort of leveled prior to, to use, uh, and these sort of things, that process could take a little while, even on a fixed base. If you started moving the aeroplane while the platform was trying to align, it got quite confused. And of course, how are you going to align a platform on a ship when the ship is moving all the time? So there were modifications needed so that they could put um, a sort of pseudo stationary um, input into the aircraft. It was just you plug this um, alignment system into the airplane on deck. Uh, other things were done w where you could connect up to the ship's inertial platform and get its position from you know. So, but but you know, kid stuff really, not uh, not groundbreaking stuff. Then there was this business of doing short takeoffs from ships with with a deck that is pitching. Now we all know how in rough water the front of a ship goes right up in the air and then goes down wallop, you know, and so on. And um, with a short takeoff, of course, you want to run along the lengths of the deck, um, perhaps four or five hundred feet, to build up a little bit of airspeed over the wing so that it can carry that couple of tons 
uh, over the vertical takeoff weight that you have the airplane at when you're full of fuel and full of weapons. So what happens if you, if, you know, you and me on a Thursday afternoon, we get to the end of the flight deck and uh, it will be pointing down at the water, which is no way to start a trip. So there was this issue of you've got to be careful of ship motion. Now you can do one or two things. If you want to fly your airplanes in rough water, you can make them lighter so that you don't have to do a short takeoff or an, and do a vertical takeoff, but that is obvious operational limitations in terms of range and payload. Or you can make them a little bit lighter so that you can pull out of the subsequent dive. Um, or you can do what Doug Taylor, a lieutenant commander in the Royal Navy, suggested, and that is put a curved ramp on the front of the boat, so called the ski jump, so that uh, whenever you exit the deck, you're always going up and away from the, the water, even if the ship is at that point of maximum bow down. So the angle of the ski jump doesn't have to be more than probably two or three degrees to to guarantee you a big trip that you will not be pointing down the water. But we started with a speed jungle of just over six and we gradually developed Doug Taylor's idea on a trials ramp at Pali Bedford. We built the, the, the ramp at Bedford and this was in 1977, the summer of 77. And, uh, by the time we finished the ski jump trials, we got the ski jump up to 20 degrees. And we have become only too well aware that you could get tremendous improvements in aircraft takeoff performance. Now you might say, well you're already at max weight, you know, what can you do with a ski jump? Answer, use only half the deck as you run at the ski jump leaving the other half of the deck free for maintenance activities, landing aeroplanes, uh, getting other aeroplanes ready to fly, whatever. So it, the ski jump was a brilliant idea. It made the aircraft very much safer. It gave it much greater performance and uh, was much easier to fly. So this work was going on apropos ships. Could I ask how you finally managed to define what, what angle the ski deck will, will be at? What, what was the yes, the, 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 it's a good question. What angle should you have the ski jump at? If you, if you look at firing artillery guns over long distances, then any um, artillery soldier will tell you that you point the barrel up at 45 degrees because this gives you the maximum ballistic range when you just throw something into the luft, um, in this case a, a shell from a, an artillery piece. And so the theory which Doug Taylor was well aware of, of this ballistic part of the trajectory, was going to be a maximum, uh, give you a maximum improvement at 45 degrees. But there was tremendous disadvantages to having a ramp of anything approaching that angle. Like you had to build it, like it was a huge thing, like it sport the nice lines of the boat. Uh, it reduced the amount of deck that the captain can have his back using and all this sort of stuff. So the, there, were th there were thoughts that we don't really want to get into, necessarily, into the ultimate capability from a ski jump. And this law of diminishing returns, which we're all familiar with, um, where a good idea, as you sort of wind up the volume on the good idea, you realise, well, it is getting a little bit better all the time, but not as much as it was right at the beginning. And um, to cut a long story short, we found 20 degrees gave you 98, 99% of what you were going to get out of the theoretical maximum and what's more at 15 degrees you got most of that as well so I don't believe there's been a ship there's so many with the ski jumps on now um, when Hermes went down to the Falklands it had 12 degree ramp I think um, speaking from memory but you know what memory's like but in general they the ramps that have gone onto ships, the Spanish ships, uh, the Spanish Navy have got one as well and so on, they've been around the 12 to 15 degrees and that gives you most of the benefits. But the other thing that was going on, um, and w w we're talking about the mid-70s now, was somebody came up with this idea of a laser and uh, these days we are so used to watching 
the accuracy of laser guided weapons going in through particular windows and all the rest of it that um, everybody understands that there is something called a laser even if they don't know how it works and it can be used to guide weapons well in the mid 70s we were getting the original RAF Harriers back to us us being Dunsfold two or three at a time and we were fitting the nose with a uh, uh, a laser rangefinder and mark target seeker as it was properly called and um, it this was just a laser that was screwed in the nose of the airplane which enabled first pass attacks um, on a target with incredible accuracy compared to anything pilots had ever been used to before and so this was giving a real boost to the Royal Air Force aeroplanes flying on their original job of close air support for the army so they were the main activities that were going on in the uh, mid 70s but in the background and so far as hawkers were concerned um, there was this thought of we ought to do a specialist version of the airplane for operating from ships we tried to interest the Royal Navy who at that time were just losing their last aircraft carrier the Ark Royal now this was a big ship flat deck catapults um, arrest of gear phantoms as fighters buccaneers as strike aircraft and they really didn't want to get rid of that ship and um, I mean if you go back through history um, there was a decision made to cancel a, a big aircraft carrier called CVA 003 or something um, which was cancelled I think the defence minister concerned was a chap called Healy anyhow in some years earlier this had been cancelled and um, so this left the Royal Navy with a decaying fleet air arm decaying on board Ark Royal Ark Royal not going to be replaced airplanes Phantom and Buccaneer not going to be replaced well um, the Navy has good PR and uh, they made the point that they really needed to be able to fly airplanes from ships in mid-ocean in order to intercept Russian Bear D aircraft which were very long range four turboprop large transport type aeroplanes but their job was to give mid course guidance to ballistic missiles after they had been launched um, and so the, the Navy felt that they needed to have some means of attacking the bears which were flying around at sort of 0.7 0.75 excuse me mark number um, at high altitude totally unencumbered really um, and so out of this notion was born the through deck cruiser they, didn't, they couldn't call it an aircraft carrier you see it had to be called a through deck cruiser this was the ship that turned out to be the Invincible class in the end and um, we had Invincible we had Illustrious and we had the next Ark Royal three of them and these were flat deck ships about 600 feet long um, no angle on the deck um, no catapults no arrest of gear just a flat top and the idea was that you flew helicopters from them in the anti-submarine role which the Royal Navy had no trouble um, making its case um, for dealing with submarines in mid-ocean um, but then there was also the thought that uh, you could fly a fixed-wing aeroplane from this ship if it had V-stock capability and certainly Hawkers wanted to do for the Royal Navy a sea harrier and we pushed very hard and certain forward-looking people in the Royal Navy also pulled very hard to try and get a sea harrier I remember about the time the decision was made to develop the Sea Harrier. Um, I'm talking now of the MOD decision and, and the Treasury to finance it and all the rest of it, and the thing went into the budget. There was still, I mean, we're talking now 1975 or 6 time, there, uh, maybe even 77 time this was going on. There was still the thought of well is it going to be minimum change or is it going to be 
a semi-clean sheet of paper new aeroplane. Well, minimum change was a philosophy that was rife with all military equipment at that time. And, um, the, you know, there is some merit to it. But we argued very, in general, we argued very strongly that in this particular instance, minimum change was not going to be what was required. For example, the role of the Sea Harrier would be Fighter Reconnaissance and Strike, FRS. Hence the FRS Mark I, which is what the first thing was called, first one was called. Fighter, air to air, shoot down other aeroplanes. Reconnaissance, smash around looking for other ships or whatever, using radar and cameras and so on. Um, and strike, which was nuclear strike in those days, uh, associated with nuclear depth charges. So, this, this aeroplane had got to be a fighter, which the Harrier was never in the RF uh, way of thinking. So, the quite low cockpit in, in an ordinary RF Harrier, if you look back behind you, such as is necessary in a fighter, all he did was look into the top of the air intake. Um, we wanted the fighter pilot to be sitting up so as he could look back over his tail. So we wanted to raise the cockpit 12 inches. And this was not a minimum change at all. Uh, we wanted to change the flight control system um, to help pilots fly from ships that are wobbling about all over the place when it comes to a vertical landing and so on. Uh, that's a bit of a minor detail, I guess, because that, that wasn't a major change, but it was something that I was very keen to do. I'd flown the airplane from a dozen or fourteen different types of ship by then, and I knew the limitations of the lateral control system, and I wanted a, a more sensitive lateral control system, but that's a sort of technical point of detail. Um, so this sea area then, were we going to do a proper thing? Were we going to take out all the magnesium that was in the RAF aeroplane? because it had a lot of magnesium in it. Now, magnesium, great thick planks of it turn into lace-like material if you put it in salt water for an hour or two. And, uh, you know, this is very bad news. Now, of course, you can paint the stuff um, and, and so on, but, but no, we wanted to get magnesium out. Um, now, this meant fairly major redesign of certain components and so on, and more testing. So to cut a long story short, we were pushing, we hawkers were pushing for something called uh, Sea Harrier to be other than minimum change. Along, uh, now, now pushing this and in his role as bandmaster was John Fozzar, the chief designer of the Harrier. Very good guy, very good guy indeed. And he certainly did not want um, a minimum change airplane and he was very keen on this race cockpit because it also gave us all sorts of other opportunities to increase the size of the nose and put a decent radar in it to increase the maintainability of the nose area in other words if you're going to have a radar in there if you're going to have a new cockpit with more up-to-date and sophisticated equipment inside it you need to you need to service this stuff you need to get the boxes in and out the RAF Harrier had been conceived right from the P1127 on a minimum change exercise right from the day one. And if you wanted to work behind the instrument panel on an RAF Harrier, you had to get into the cockpit upside down, you know, and, and uh, so this one guy can work in the cockpit. Well, that's no good, is it? You know. So we wanted to put um, panels in the side of the fuselage that you could remove that gave you good access standing on the ground alongside the airplane up behind the instrument panel for example well you can't just cut holes in airplanes and um that exist and say oh we'll give you a, pa a hatch there because you it depends what's behind it and the wiring and all the rest of it so the w we wanted to do a completely revamped nose forward of the wing basically and i think you can see the reasons why we would well, the chief scientist of the day uh, for the government was a chap called Sir Herman Bondy, and um, he came along to Kingston, and we had a big meeting with him, and we saw, we, Fossard's team, of which I was part, um, we saw convincing Herman Bondy of the need 
to do a completely new front end to this airplane. And we were able to do this. Um, it was it was one of those things which was a seminal moment so far as um, the company was concerned because we we got out of that meeting the approval to do not a minimum change but a proper redesigned airplane but the company and people don't know this unless they were there at the meeting the company it was for the workers other than John Fozard it was also another seminal moment because John Fozard was the most capable chief designer I have ever known he was brilliant but he was a Yorkshireman he got an ego you know five times the size of the county as they have he was normally quite right so you couldn't knock him but my word you know um, there was nobody better than John Fozard and he was quite sure of that and so were we so he decided that it would be too difficult to try and convince Herman Bondi with a two-dimensional presentation using slides and engineering drawings of the need for what was a three-dimensional problem looking back behind you so he built a complete mock-up I mean cardboard and wood and this sort of thing um, cockpit, uh, uh, the raised cockpit uh, Kingston you see and uh, so that you could sit people in it and let them see what the improvement of the view was and so just before lunch at this meeting um, John Fossard said so we, were, we wonder if uh, just before lunch you would like to go with John Farley our Deputy Chief Test Pilot and sit in the three dimensional mock up that we have because um, we, we believe that for most people uh, having this three dimensional arrangement makes it easier to appreciate what we're talking about and this chap Herman Bondi I mean there wasn't, there wasn't a millisecond's pause Mr. Fozard, he said, I am used to working in four dimensions here. He said, it's not a problem for me. Because Herman Bondi had been a space scientist, and so he was dealing with time as well. You know. But it was, the, it was the way you could almost hear the air coming out of John Fozard. Just shh, you know, as he collapsed. And, uh, but, I mean, it, it's a trivial little point, but my word, it made the rest of his team feel good. Uh, <laughs> anyhow, we got the Sea Harrier out of this. And, um, and don't think I'm knocking John Foz, because I'm not. He, he was brilliant at his job quite brilliant but he, he did have he did have personal issues that um, tried our patience once or twice anyhow we got the sea harrow out of this and really once the arguing was done there was never going to be a technical problem in doing any of it the issue with the sea area, as I recall it, the years and years of struggling with the sea area was not with the flight development, it was with the getting the original approval to do it. Um, the team was totally competent in actually doing it once we were allowed to. Your experience as a, as a fighter pilot did that help with the Sea Harrier in, in any respects? Because obviously you, you take it from a point of view, don't you, that's slightly different again. And you, you know what a fighter pilot would need from an aircraft. So were you able to input that into the team's work? Oh, I think it was common sense, yes. So, well, the answer is yes, so one was. Um, but then so were all the other test pilots at Dunsford. They were all ex-fighter or instructor pilots who all understood the basic tactics associated with air combat and so on. I mean, we can't remember when we didn't know all that stuff. I mean, it goes back to the First World War. Um, people had to see the enemy and try and shoot them down. If, you, if the enemy saw you first and you didn't see him, he shot you down and you often never knew he was there. And I'm told that it was exactly the same in the Battle of Britain. The majority of people were shot down by somebody they never knew was there. So this business of view... In, in a complex tactical air-to-air -air situation, confused tactical air-to-air -air situation is very is vitally important. And if you look at modern, I mean, 21st century jet fighters, they all have the cockpit perched up, despite the terrible penalty to drag, to radar signature, and so on. So for me then, once, w once we had the decision to go ahead with a Sea Harrier, formal Sea Harrier development program, I was never in any doubt that we could do a successful aeroplane. Um, 
and I don't think anybody at Hawkers was, um, and I don't think anybody in the Royal Air Force who'd flown the existing land harrier thought we would um, have any problems in producing this better version. But the rest of the world didn't want to know about it. I mean, as far as the rest of the world was concerned, it was a Mickey Mouse little toy aeroplane, uh, Harrier that is, uh, largely produced to improve the quality of air shows. You know, it didn't have any significant uh, effect on the military scene. Had you been involved in any demonstrations to, to foreign governments with the Harrier at all? Yes, I, I, I'd done demonstrations all over the world. Uh, on various ships, on various air bases, I've uh, been all over the place. And um, uh, I mean, on that side, I even flew from the Argentinian aircraft carrier 25th de Mayo. Um, they bought the, air, the ship second hand from the Dutch, I think it was called the Carol Dorman when it was with the Dutch, and I heard that they were going to steam it down the channel. Uh, as a non-operational ship, you know, just something they bought in the shipyard and they're going to steam it to Argentina and, and fit it out and have a fleet air arm. Um, and I heard it was going to go down the channel, so we contacted the Argentinian embassy and said, could we come along and bring a Harrier? Oh, well, no, the ship won't be operational. It doesn't have to be operational, you know. It's a, it's a flat piece of metal going down the channel. We can land on it. We can take off. And so, yes, we did arrange um, a fairly high-powered... Uh, demonstration on board that ship and I think the Argentinian Navy were very impressed in the event buying Harriers or Sea Harriers as they would have been because this was before Sea Harrier days um, was going to be expensive and the Americans for reasons best known to themselves were trying to unload second hand A4s which were virtually free and so in the end the Argentinian Navy decided that they would have a great box of these uh, A4s and not have the expensive Harriers and wasn't that a good job because uh, otherwise things might have been quite different in 1982 but yes we'd flown from lots of ships and, and in different countries there was a there was one session we had where the Shah of Iran because he was the Shah still then um, he wanted a ship with Harriers on it and um, the funny places that you went to briefing his team of people and the secrecy and so on and so forth was really quite an eye-opener. However, um, yeah, once, once we got this Sea Harrier contract, our biggest problem was probably the Royal Navy. Um, that's, that's the wrong thing to say. The biggest problem was probably the fleet air on pilots because they were buccaneer men, they were phantom men, they derided this little tiny harrier. Do you remember the marine who was a phantom man and he couldn't see why I had to teach him how to tax it so he lost control taxing? Um, well, you know, one of, it was that sort of stuff again. So I was asked by our marketing people and PR people to go and talk to the Royal Navy. It was a, it was a weapons a Royal Navy Fleet Air Arm Weapons Tactics School. I can't remember the proper title of it, I'm sorry. Anyhow, it was it was the college for air warfare, if you like, that the Royal Navy had, which all its Fleet Air Arm people used to attend. So I was asked to go along and give a presentation on this this aeroplane, this new Harrier. And, and I had all these hairy old fleet air arm guys in the audience and I couldn't get a word in it I was just being heckled and shouted at and all the rest of it so I had to wait until they ran out of breath and then I just let fly I said I'm very sorry I'm sure you would like a big boat I'm sure you would like more modern aeroplanes but you can't have them nobody's going to let you have them so you must shut up and listen to me tell you about what you will have and actually you may be quite surprised at how useful it will be so when, when I say you know that we had our own internal enemies um, that, that's the sort of thing in the event of course 
when you start telling them what a sea har what a harrier could do from a short deck and what he could carry and what it could do um, oh well I see oh, well, I didn't realise it might be as good as that alright yeah okay but it's still not supersonic is it you know and all this sort of rubbish and um, and no it's not supersonic and isn't that a jolly good job because supersonic airplanes get so hot they suck in every infrared missile so people never don't actually fly in combat supersonically at least not unless they've got a stealthy airplane like the F-22 so anyway there was all this rubbish going on in, in the background and, and when as a test pilot you sit between the company designers who are trying to deal with the technicalities of this and that and the future operational pilots who um, are, um, are putting bumper stickers on their car as they did with the Hawk at Dunsford when we were starting to deliver Hawks to the Royal Air Force we were taking them to a station where every car had a big sticker on the back saying stamp out Hawk, bring back Hunter you see, because the guys concerned thought the Hunter was more of a man's aeroplane than the Hawk. So you you have this service mentality, which, um, I mean, it was rubbish. Uh, it, it, we digress slightly, but if that's all right for a moment, when, when we started de delivering Hawks, and I mean, we're talking 76 or 7... 76 time I suppose now well, we Dunsfold delivered the first few Hawks off the production line to Chivena and, um, and Brody and, and that's where the RAF started to use them in parallel with the hunters that they were getting rid of or were being made obsolete after we had delivered I don't know six or eight of these things they had some qualified pilots who would then come over and collect the next one well one of these was a chap called Puddy Cat and he and I had been uh, hunter pilots together in the past and um, we were in the coffee bar Puddy and I um, and he was just waiting for them to tow his new airplane out the hangar um, and he looked at me and he looked to see if there was anybody behind me and out in the corridor and so on in other words the sort of checks that somebody makes before they say something where they do not want to be overheard you know he said John he said um, what is it with this hawk and I said what do you mean Puddy he said well whenever you do air combat with it he said you finish up the fight higher then you started the fight with a hunter whenever you finish up the fight you're always lower than you started and it's uh, and it's normally stopped by the presence of the ground I said Puddy what do you do when you are in your fighter and you can't pull any more G and the aircraft has got more performance than you as an individual can handle with that black and air oh climb he said I said, Puddy, think about it. And of course, for the first time, the um, the Royal Air Force had got an aeroplane that could pull more G than the pilots could stand and sustain it. And so these poor blokes who'd been used to a hunter, which when you pull six or seven G in a hunter, it just slowed down so quickly with its old-fashioned design that now you can pull more than 4G or 5G because you're going slower so there was never any issue and uh, and you always finished up going downwards as you try to get your speed back again in a combat but with a Hawk you could fly it all day at its limiting G until you ran out of fuel and uh, because it had very low induced drag and uh, brilliant and uh, so anyhow, I'm sorry you, you, the, the service pilot um, will always look back to his previous type with often uh, undeserved affection and, um, and then when he gets his new one of course he's over the moon but, but initially when all they've done is talk about it they don't want it because it doesn't so we had this problem with the Sea Harrier as well as the Hawk versus Hunter it was Sea Harrier versus Phantom and Buccaneer Could I ask about actually landing a uh, Harrier on, on, a, on a, a ship basically and, and does it differ from what you would do coming into land on land and are there any things that you have to be much more aware of in that situation? Well yes, I mean landing on a ship that is not at anchor um, is clearly different from landing on an airfield because the airfield is moving. Now movement when you're coming into land is a sort of relative thing. If your airfield was 
travelling at 30 miles an hour in a westerly direction from Heathrow, then the airliners coming into land would have no trouble catching Heathrow, would they, you know? Um, but, of course, it would, it would mean that their apparent approach speed was less um, than, than it might have been otherwise. And uh, so that, that's fine. I mean, if, if, the, if the airfield is moving at, shall we say, 95% of your speed away from you, then you catch it ever so slowly, and you seem to be coming into land ever so slowly, don't you? And so, in general, I suppose you could say that if an airfield can move, it makes life a little easier, because the relative approach speed seems slower. But in the case of a ship, the disadvantages of the fact that the ship isn't rock steady but is bobbling about on top of this rough ocean um, tends to do away with those advantages and so you may find that the beginning of your runway or in other words the back of the ship is physically moving up and down plus or minus 10 feet now, we know which bit you're going to aim for, sort of thing. You aim too low and you go wallop into the back of the boat. You aim too high and you go off the front without even touching the steamer. So, hence the issue of having to have stabilised approach sites and, and so on. And uh, the mirror landing aid, which is a space stabilised thing, which uh, enables the pilot to fly down the mean path that is necessary with the boat going up and down. Well, when you're going to land vertically... There are two stages to the process. The first thing is establish a hover alongside or just behind the ship. Watch what the ship is doing at this particular time, then step forward or sideways and flop onto it. So you, you, the advantage with a Harrier in, in the presence of ship motion is that you can just carry on with your approach and the approach is satisfactory once you've established the hover. If you come to the hover, perhaps because of a poorly judged approach, a hundred yards in front of the ship, you put the brakes on too late, then so what? You just sit there and hover over the sea and the steamer appears alongside you, you know, ten seconds later. Um, it really is a joy to do an approach to a ship in the, if you've got hovering capability, because there is no problem whatsoever. But once you decide to come over the deck to do your actual vertical landing, then you have to be careful not to slavishly try and follow every little twitch of the flight deck underneath you. You have to look in the distance at the horizon and with your per and steady your aeroplane, as it were, over the seabed and let this steamer, which is between you and the seabed, um, wobble about and you just pick the middle position and say all right uh, I should be over, over that tiny spot you know I'm a little bit left a little bit right but that, you know I'm in average in that right place and you pick your moment and you just pop down on the deck and dump it where you want to so it's a two-stage process <coughs> excuse me and um, the the secret is funnily enough exactly the same as if you're a red arrow pilot flying formation in a battle. You are formating on the ship. The ship is your leader and he's bobbling about in turbulence just like any other airplane. He can't hold. And you, it's, if you were to try and slavishly follow your leader, by the time you got to four or five men out on the wing, uh, they'd be going all over the place. So everybody has to sit and let the person either side of them bobble about without worrying too much about that fine point of detail. Does, does that make sense here? Yeah. Okay. Um, the issue of ship motion, of course, is fundamental to differences between doing a vertical landing on, on land or on, on a ship flight deck. And one of the things that I think if we think about it, we all appreciate, but we do have to think about it, is that when a ship is rolling, and by that, you know what I mean, as it goes along, it's rolling from side to side, we often, if we're trying to walk through the corridors of a ship or, or on the flight deck, we find ourselves staggering slightly if we haven't got something to hang on to. And this is because the ship doesn't roll 
about the axis, about an axis that is in the floor we're standing on. Let, let's go to the flight deck of an aircraft carrier. The flight deck might be 50, 60 feet above the water. The ship is rolling about an axis that's in the water. So the flight deck doesn't just tilt left, then tilt right, tilt left, tilt right. It tilts left and sways over to the left. It goes as far as it's going to go, and then it starts coming back towards level, but the deck is moving sideways under our feet until it goes right out the other side again. So, in a Harrier, if you sit in a hover over the top of a ship that is doing that sort of motion, with a little bit of experience, you set about going downwards so that you'll hit the deck as the deck is level because that's nice for your wheels, isn't it? You know, just as you want your wings level and you, you want to land with the deck level. Well, unfortunately, when you get it just right like that, you won't have the tidiest looking arrival because the ship's got its maximum sideways speed on there, or the flight deck has got its maximum sideways speed. And as the ship, as the airplane hits the deck, it will have to be accelerated sideways and this will give it the appearance of a great lurch as the ship transfers its motion through the tyres and the friction into the aeroplane and the aeroplane gives a wobble on its undercoach. So you often see, if a ship has some motion, pilots landing and it looks as if it, right at the very last moment he went, oh, oh dear. Um, but that's nothing to do with the pilot, it's just the reality of, uh, of ship motion. Um, there's another aspect of ship motion and that is when you do the short takeoff. I mean, we mentioned the bow down thing and the ski jump looking after that, but there is also this left right issue. Um, again, we said the ship is rolling left, right, left, right, about some point down at sea level. That means that the white line that you are steering along is literally moving sideways for a while and then it rushes off sideways the other way over the seabed. Do you follow? And so the inertia of your aircraft, that is the normal sort of um, forces that you're trying to overcome when you accelerate an airplane, all those inertia based forces, as far as they're concerned, you're trying to go in a straight line over the seabed. Well the gear won't let you because the straight line you're following is actually describing a sort of S motion over the seabed and uh, you actually have to weave over the seabed in order to stay on the white line um, so whenever you do a short takeoff on a ship the first time it has motion on you find, for some unknown reason, you can't stay on the white line. You think, God, why can't I do You know, I thought I knew how to keep this thing straight, and here I'm lurching all over the place. Well, a moment's thought in the bath explains why you're having this problem. Because you are used to going in a straight line, and you haven't got to go in a straight line, you've got to go in a zigzag. Well, that's very difficult to do. And, um, and it seemed to me that the answer to this was to have a pair of parallel lines and we call them tram lines and the, these two lines rather than the single centre line define the safe area for you to wander about in so relax and sit off down the, down the, um, the deck do not over control do not try and be tremendously precise directionally just relax and do nothing providing you stay between these two lines end of broadcast and, and it's, it's a delight uh, the Navy didn't like having to put tram lines on because um, I said and by the way you've got to do this at night oh dear I said yes and so they had to put twice the number of, of deck lights in to illuminate the line and I can remember going to the uh, to the MOD a few weeks before they launched Invincible saying I'm sorry chaps you've got to put another row of lights in oh you know it's a major mob we should get taken to we should get taken to the cleaners by a vicars who will so you've got to take out these lights and put in you know we can't I said well in that case you know forget having Harriers uh, so you know you have these funny little sort of knock-on effects when you are uh, trying to get a new system into service 
how did the development program pan out once you got the go ahead? What was the kind of the, the, how did you structure it then? From well, the the structure of the Sierra Flight Development Program was totally standard. There was a specification which had been agreed on paper between the two parties and um, or between us, uh, the company and MOD procurement executive and in order to show that your aircraft meets the specification because the specification isn't necessarily going to be just how long it is and how much it can carry but it must be maybe some other performance aspects and so on and serviceability so you, you, you will out of the specification you will come up with a list of, of sort of milestones which are contract definition points um, what, what were called in the trade spec points um, we had to go and demonstrate that we met the spec and some of those demonstrations could only be done in flight and, uh, but it was all stri quite straightforward there, there were no technical issues and, uh, and uh, we, we knew our aeroplane inside out we knew because we had worked on the spec, we had we had suggested what it should be like, for goodness sake, you know, because we knew what we could do. But I mentioned that the rest of the world, you know, didn't really believe us at all, and um, it wasn't until the Falklands happened, when 21 sea areas went down all that way, they were serviceable all the time they didn't have to keep having engine changes none of the th dire things that were forecast and perceived as being the result of it being just an air show aeroplane you know uh, the only people who used to deride a harrier were those people who had no personal experience of it now they may have had their own reasons vested interest if they make ordinary conventional aircraft they're going to suggest the harrier's rubbish aren't they um, you know, there was a lot of that. But after the after the Falklands War, the whole thing just changed totally. Was there an element, I think you mentioned it before, of some of the people who derided the Harrier, uh, or the Sea Harrier, um, was it their lack of understanding of the aircraft as well? I think you mentioned before, sometimes some of the aviation press had got the wrong end of the mm. thing. Was that still continuing on to, to the sort of Sea Harrier phase? Oh, I think so, yes. And uh, you won't stamp it out. I mean, I, what was I looking at the other day? It was a chap on the television who was extolling the virtues of um, of the new joint strike fighter and so on and he still felt that when you operated vertically you had this huge fuel penalty and I mean it, it is so obviously wrong to anybody who thinks the first time the Royal Air Force produced eight or ten aeroplanes at a Farnborough air show was, I think it was 1971 or two, and one squadron came along, and they had all their aeroplanes airborne together, they came to the hover, spaced all along the main runway, you see, and, and they're sitting there doing a combined bow and this sort of drill manoeuvres, and there was a United States Air Force general with his entourage standing in the Hawker City Chalet you see and he was banging on because the United States Air Force has never been a fan of Easter he was banging on about what a waste of fuel and all the rest of it this was and uh, and I, I stood up close behind him and said no it's not like that sir they've got jet engines you see and um nothing happened the first time I said it so I repeated it and you could see the aides on either side horrified that this bloke who they had no idea who I was um, you know in hospitality shall I saying to their to their general that these things have got jet engines you know I said you know sir jet engines the air comes in the front you burn fuel in it and it rushes out the back and it gives you thrust that's a jet engine now unfortunately the amount of fuel you can burn in such a jet engine depends on how much air you can get through it those chaps can't get much air through they're having to suck it through and so their fuel consumption is not that high when they are flying along fast the air's rammed into their intakes and you can burn a lot more fuel and well I mean it's, it's just the fact of life that some people who you would think would be properly educated are not. They have these preconceived ideas. Don't tell me about that, my mind's made up type stuff. Um, sorry, uh, yes, there are other misconceptions. And, and that still exists today. So, 
And as you were developing the Sea Harrier, um, what were the main sort of trial areas that you were, you were working on? Can you explain to me? I know obviously you said how the specification works, but what were the areas that you were looking at? Well, we had a new range of stores that the aircraft had to carry. Um, they were different from the ones at the Royal Air Force. We had this thing called Sea Eagle, which is a big anti-shipping missile. Um, we... It, during the actual stage just before we got the contract to do the Sea Harrier, we had to demonstrate one or two things which the Navy would need in their spec and demonstrate them to the satisfaction of the MOD without the Sea Harrier happening. So we took a Royal Air Force Harrier development aeroplane and we did things with it um, which suggested quite clearly that we would be able to meet our targets on the sea here. For example, I fired a Martel. Now, a Martel was a, a very large air-to-surface missile, weighed about 1,800 pounds, um, and it was a TV-guided thing in those days. It was used from Buccaneers. Um, I fired a Martel from an RAF Harrier to show that it would have no trouble dealing with a Sea Eagle which hadn't yet happened, which was only going to be 1,500 pounds in weight and would actually do a lot of things that the Martel would not do, you know, in the normal course of improvement. So, yes, we fired a, a Martel. Um, we a I actually came to the hover with a Martel on one side and not on the other because people were saying, if you take off with two sea eagles and you only fire at one target, the thing's too expensive, you must better bring it back. So we demonstrated that with only a 200 pound weight um, balancing store on the other outboard pylon, we could bring back a single sea eagle. So the idea was that when you took off with sea eagles, you would have a lead weight of 200 pounds on each of your outboard pylons and in the event that you only got rid of one sea eagle then you jettison the other lead weight and you came back and landed vertically that was the notion behind it all so yes there were things like that that we did we had to demonstrate that the aircraft would stall properly and uh, maneuver properly with this new raised cockpit which had I mean, the whole nose in front of the intakes was a different shape, and so lots of the engine work had to be cleared. But nothing, nothing uh, revolutionary, just ordinary standard flight development test work. Am I right in thinking that you had some uh, development work on the heads-up display for the pilots as well? The, yes, the, the avionics of which the head-up display was just one aspect was continually changing in both the Royal Air Force and the Sea Harrier uh, program because the avionics manufacturers were coming up with better kit and so the head-up display had more and more symbols and things put on it for the Royal Air Force when it came to the laser being fitted and so on. And exactly the same thing with the with the Royal Navy. Um, we had better optics in the Royal Navy because uh, for the head-up display um, because people had produced better optics 15 years later than when the first Royal Air Force HUDs were done. Um, so, yeah, that, but this is all routine, gradual, progressive improvement. So the head-up display was better. Um, and better can be defined as clearer, uh, brighter, shows up against, the images show up against a, a bright light better. Um, and also something called the field of view, which is um, how accurately you have to position your head in the cockpit to see all the information. Um, with the original he head up displays, you had to put your head in a pretty specific position if you were to see it all a bit like using binoculars you know um, as the optics got improved there was more flexibility in where your head could be when you glanced at the head up display um, these days of course they have not got rid of the head up display but it is no longer on the aeroplane it is on the helmet so with a typhoon, they're going to have helmet-mounting displays. Um, with the Joint Strike Fighter, it's a helmet-mounted display. 
This means, of course, that you carry the display with you wherever you turn your head. So, but this is all just progressive and gradual stuff, and it's, it's not got anything to do really with um, with how you make the flying machine work better. And with the radar that had been introduced, um, were there any trials on the radar, or was it was that something that was? No, there, there were some very interesting trials to be done with the radar, and we used a two-seat hunter for that purpose. Um, we fitted the Sea Harrier radar into the nose of a specially modified two-seat hunter and we could then take a radar boffin along in the other seat and show him what was right or wrong with his radar. Um, I'm, I, I'm struggling with the dates again but I would think it would be somewhere around the 1977 70 probably 78 time when as part of the build up of the actual Sea Harrier development program we got clearance to modify two hunters one of them was going to the Royal Navy for training and the other was staying at Dunsfold for um, for development work of the radar I was only too conscious that because I was chief test pilot by then that the the other pilots in my team were all ex-Royal Air Force pilots and whilst we'd all been fighter pilots in some era or other and while we'd all been instructor pilots which was also important uh, to understand some of the issues of training service pilots and so on none of us had been fleet air arm pilots now this bothered me because I had no idea what a fleet air on pilot did after he took off from his ship. I was sufficiently arrogant that I didn't need any help from Royal Navy pilots to tell me how to take off and land on their ship because that was a Harrier peculiar thing and I'd done it from 12 or 14 ships anyhow by then. But I was very conscious that the the way they tactically organised, navigated, controlled and everything else, their aeroplanes from ships, we knew nothing about because the whole moving base thing, I mean you, you could be away for an hour and your base has moved 30 miles um, and, and there are the tactics associated with submarines and other surface fleets and you know the whole thing so I wanted some advice on this because I wanted to make sure that what we were putting into the cockpit of this Sea Harrier was optimised for somebody that needed to do that sort of job with his airplane not just the takeoff and landing bit and so I went to some friends in the Royal Navy and said look I want your best one of your best youngsters off Ark Royal which was just decommissioning um, I, I want one of your best young fighter pilots to come and be a Royal Navy liaison officer at Dunsfold well, what's he going to do? Well, he's going to sit around in the crew room with us and he's going to talk about tactics. He's going to go to meetings with us where we discuss what's going in the aeroplane and so on. He's going to be responsible for educating us, the Dunsfold pilots, about what we, what we don't know about naval operations. Fine. I said, um, by the way, it would help if he could read and write properly because I, I, I mean a lot of very good service pilots do it intuitively they couldn't describe what is important they couldn't argue the case in a meeting they're brilliant when it comes to actually executing it but then they just get drunk and don't know what you know till they go and brilliantly do it again um, I said I want somebody who can talk and, and, and actually explain things and so they sent me somebody called Taylor Scott and uh, he was personal enough young gentleman and um a lieutenant commander and uh, and so within a day or two in coming to Dunsfold I said right Taylor we're going off in the Hunter and uh, he was going to have his first look at um, the Sea Harrier cockpit roughly as we had lashed it up in the right hand side of this Hunter and the radar and all well I don't know 20 minutes into that sorty I realised that uh, it wasn't just a case of Taylor helping us. Taylor ought to be running that Hunter two-seat development program. He ought to be put in charge of it because his comments and his 
his perceptiveness about the whole thing was way beyond the capabilities that we had. And of course the Navy were very happy and, and Taylor did a brilliant job. He, he spent all of his time talking to our radar engineers and our head-up display engineers and our cockpit designers about these fleet air arm aspects. And he, he could make good arguments, he could write good reports, he could study the minutes of meetings and say that's wrong, they've got to check. He, he was brilliant and he was absolutely super. And if there was one person that um, deserves a medal for the way the Sea Harrier was operated in the Falklands, I don't mean just the way it flew, I mean the way it was operated, it's Taylor because he, he made sure that what was in that cockpit was what the naval pilots needed to do their job. Being, he was fairly sort of uh, outgoing chap, like a lot of service pilots are, and of course he didn't just want to fiddle about with the hunter, he wanted to fly Harriers. And um, there was no way I could get him approval to, easily anyhow, to approval to fly Harriers. Because by then, and we're talking 78 or 9 time, 9 time, um, you could no longer just jump into a Harrier and fly it. Um, because there was now a Harrier training system. And the sort of health and safety people, you know, would say, well, he's got to go and do the Harrier course. And somebody got to pay for that course, etc., etc. But Taylor used to come in on four or five times a year and kick the other side of my office desk and say, I'm off if you don't get me on Harrier course and all this sort of thing. And one day he came along absolutely on, on the last draw and he said, I'm off. I said, when you're off, he said, tomorrow. And I said, well, that's a pity, because you could start the course on Tuesday. And uh, and I just managed to fix him up with the course, you see. So, of course, he was over, he was over the moon. But poor lad, um, he was later killed in a, in a Harrier, an RAF Harrier, uh, with a, a bang seat malfunction, an eject seat malfunction, where he got tossed out of the airplane at high altitude. Um, but there we are, that's just life. And... Uh, these things happen. But Taylor Scott was absolutely instrumental in the operational efficiency of that aeroplane. When the Falklands War happened, of course, he wanted to go down there. And the Navy, and full marks to them, they wouldn't let him go. They said, you are coming to Yelverton, and you are going to finish the training of the Harrier pilots that are halfway through. They realised, if you like, the sort of... Uh, multiplying factor that uh, Taylor could apply and of course he hated being there but he managed to produce during the short course of the war uh, another four or five Harrier pilots and um, that, was, that was Royal Navy Harrier pilots that was very good. Um, Can you think of anything specifically that, that he was able to well instill in the team I'm trying to think of what, what, what knowledge he gave you or what things specifically he, was, he could think of that, that, that you hadn't thought of or you needed. Well, yes, his, his experience enabled him to sort out something called the mode and switching document. Now, when you look at the cockpit of a modern military airplane, it's full of switches and dials and knobs and buttons and goodness knows what. And you might say, well, what's all that about? Well, the answer is it's about controlling what is... A, complicated piece of equipment. Now, the various modes that you can set a cockpit up, I mean, you mentioned the head-up display, there were over a hundred different pages of information that could be put up on the head-up display. And so you could optimise the information that was on head-up display for the particular task of a particular sortie. There was one, for example, for controlling a ski jump takeoff at night. Um, there was another one for dealing with a sea eagle and so on. And Taylor was able to prioritise, I hate that word, but we all use it now, prioritise these modes to establish which were the important ones, which were the ones that were easiest to select in the cockpit and not buried deep in the menu, you know? Uh, which ones are going to be default, what's the, you know, all these sort of things. Where do we physically put three or four of these switches? Because they've got to be operated in that order. So that's what I mean when I say that Taylor was able to 
improve the operational efficiency, not the flying machine efficiency, but the, the ability to use that device to fight with. Um, all down to him, that cockpit. I suggested that the Falklands War transformed the reputation of the of the Harrier and the Sea Harrier um, because, of course, it did everything that we had ex expected it to and the world, by and large, did not expect it to. I happened to be airborne the Friday uh, that it all started in XZ450, which was the first Sea Harrier prototype. I was flying with two Sea Eagles on the aeroplane um, plus a couple of sidewinders, plus a couple of guns. A very heavy configuration. And I was looking at conventional stalling characteristics of the aeroplane um, with all that load on. And I landed, um, I went into flight development to debrief the sortie with my roll of instrumentation tape and all the rest of it and stuff. And... Um, and I'm halfway through this debrief when the door gets kicked in and uh, in comes Taylor Scott, about a foot and a half off the floor, saying that uh, he was off, he's going back to the Navy, there was a war on and he, he was off. And so I sort of smiled at him and I said, um, sorry Taylor, I said, um, what's happening? He said, oh, he said, we, we're, we're going to get a war. And I said, uh, all right, well, I, I don't think it'll all be settled in the next couple of hours, so let me just finish this debrief, and then you and I can go and talk about what's happening. So I went along to the tower afterwards, and, and he explained that um, the Argentinians had invaded and a task force was going to go down, and they wanted all the sea harriers. I said, OK, well... Um, Right, this is a Friday afternoon, and normally on that day, um, the place shut down about 4.30. So, we made preparations for having the night shift enhanced, shall we say, to try and get as many aeroplanes prepared as we could. And I went home to have some tea, and while I was having some tea, the telephone went... And it was one of the policemen on the main gate saying that they, they're manning the tower and they're putting all the airfield lights on. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, the Navy are coming in and they want all the lights on. So I said, you go and turn all the lights off and um, shut down air traffic. I said, because the Navy's not coming in here tonight. We are not ready for them. And, uh, you know, this needs to be done in slightly slower time. I don't mind if the ships are steaming off. We'll soon catch those over the next couple of days. Leave us in peace. We want to... So the Navy did come and were sent away with a flea in their ear. Uh, they were arriving in various helicopters with a whole lot of Harrier pilots and they were going to take away everything they could let. I mean, there was that sort of silliness going on at the time. Well, we worked long and hard that weekend. And, in fact, Saturday morning, Taylor Scott took 450 and landed on Hermes in, in the dock as they were preparing the ship and um, so so gradually during the course of Friday night and Saturday and Sunday night um, we prepared all the sea harriers that were in anything like uh, deliverable condition and the preparation meant not just putting them together but taking out our uh, test equipment and so on which you know was only going to encumber them now as it happened I was booked on an airliner on the Sunday to go to the United States in order to carry on with some engine development trials at Edwards Air Force Base on the AV-8B from the Marine Corps the big wing so yes I had to go off to the States um, on the Sunday and there seemed no reason to, to change my plans um there was nothing more the people at Dunsfold could do to help the Royal Navy, um, apart from these the final preparations of the last airplane in the hangar and so on. And, uh, and so I went off to the States, as planned. And in the normal way in the States, you would live in a motel somewhere and go in and out to work at the airfield where you were. And on this particular occasion, um, I was living in a typical American motel, and I would come in in the evening, turn on the television, and as the television went live, so you would see the latest news from the Falklands. 
Now this was quite unlike what new guys had in the United Kingdom. Because the Argentinians were feeding the CNN and so on of this world and the ABCs with daily video footage that they had shot and they had approved and they had cleared, etc. Et then it's fine. And uh, so what sort of thing? And there was this period of sort of false calm while the ships, the task force steamed south. I mean, there was a thick end of two weeks involved. They, they moved south, going slower and slower. Well, the hope was that the political side of things would be sorted out. Then it became clear that it was not going to be sorted out and fighting was going to happen. Well, I went back in one evening after that and as I turned on the television there was tonight's video footage and it showed the wreckage of XZ450 on the rocks and um, I knew it was genuine, I knew it wasn't fake, I mean I could recognise all sorts of things on the airplane and its registration number and so on and the, the cameraman was panning around the wreckage of the reaction control system in the wingtip and so on and I thought, oh dear, oh dear, why that aeroplane? You know, because there was a sort of sentimental attachment to it. It was the first one we'd had. It was the first one we took to Farnborough. We ran out the ski jump at Farnborough, and I've been flying it that, that uh, Friday when the balloon went up and so on. Well, what I didn't realise at that time was that the loss of that aeroplane and its pilot, um, Nick Taylor, um, was absolutely instrumental in probably saving more lives than any other event that happened down in the Falklands. And you might say, what on earth do you mean by that? Well, XZ450 had been our Sea Eagle trials aeroplane. And I mentioned, in fact, that I was flying it with two Sea Eagles on um, immediately before. It had, therefore, the full Sea Eagle weapon control panel in the cockpit. And I don't mean a mock-up test and experimental thing. I mean a proper production standard Sea Eagle control panel, night lighting the whole lot on it. So when the Argentinians got to the wreckage and they found this Sea Eagle control panel in the cockpit, they very reasonably thought that it was typical of all of the sea areas and so the Mamma Mia or whatever you know um, oh golly you know the fleet's got a sea eagle capability and because of this the aircraft carrier never left port because they were afraid that it would just be sunk by sea eagles which were a better piece of kit than Exocet and um, because they were more modern and we know how, how much damage Exocet did to our fleet uh, Belgrano wandered out um, and we know what happened to that so apart from that unhappy episode the Argentinian Navy really didn't get in the fight all the aircraft were launched from land bases whether they were Navy aeroplanes or Air Force aeroplanes and therefore they had the disadvantage of the extreme range they were having to operate at well just imagine if 450 hadn't been shot down if they hadn't suddenly found out mis misinformation as it happens that you know that they got this capability then we could have seen the Argentinian Navy fighting the Royal Navy and um, the Royal Navy would have been at a big disadvantage all that distance from home uh, the outcome could have been very very different and I'm quite sure many many more lives would have been lost so it's funny how things work out at times, isn't it? Mm. What about the performance of the, the, the Sea Harrier in the Falklands? Because obviously you would you understood an awful lot about the aircraft, um, and you would have been fed back, I assume, some information about that about mm. performance. Did it did it live up to expectations? For what you thought, or was there anything was there anything new that was introduced that you may not? No, no. Um, it, it did everything that it said on the tin, you know, uh, as far as we were concerned, and we were we were very pleased because confident though we had been in the airplane's capabilities and its serviceability and all the rest of it, 
there is nothing like the real operational test of actually being used in war. So we were, to some extent, relieved that we hadn't oversold this piece of kit and that our confidence had not been misplaced because it, uh, it wasn't and, um, and that, was, that was excellent. Because uh, I believe the Argentinians were quite fearful of the Sea Harrier um, <coughs> as an aircraft to engage because obviously you've talked quite a lot about how pilots initially thought, uh, uh, British pilots thought initially about it not being some supersonic and that but as a fighter it performed remarkably well didn't it? Yes, it did, and largely because it had uh, uh, not just the Sidewinder, but the AIM-9 Lima version, the L version, which um, had much better acquisition characteristics than, um, than the earlier version. Now, the AIM-9 Lemas, Lemas were provided by the United States quietly to our Royal Navy. We didn't have them when the war started and they were a devastating piece of kit um, if uh, I think the Argentinians lost the the battle the battle against the task force because they used the wrong tactics this is just me now but uh, I've talked to other people and I've never had my views rubbished um, the, ar the tactics of the Argentinian pilots were that they should ignore any Harriers that they came across um, and press on with their attacks and by ignore I mean don't drop your weapons in the sea and turn and fight try and outrun them or whatever and get on with your attack if they had been briefed if you see a Harrier dump your weapons and fight the Harrier I think we would have lost the war not because the Harrier was inferior to the airplanes they had but it didn't have that much of an advantage and we had 21 airplanes they had 120 or 125 on a sheer attrition basis they could have wiped out our Sea Harrier fleet over a week and then they could have strolled about the air above the battle fleet with impunity they would have had air supremacy not just air superiority air supremacy and they could then have in their own time taken out our ships with conventional attacks um, with missiles and with bombs but they weren't briefed to fight like that they were briefed the other way around and I think that is probably one of the reasons that they lost the war at the time I remember hearing of a tactic that was employed with the Sea Harrier um, which was called viffing is, is that something that w was employed or to what extent and did yeah. you have any knowledge of that as a yes indeed viffing is something that often gets raised in the context of the uh, of the Falklands viffing V-I-F-F in stands for vectoring in forward flight it means using the nozzle lever not to provide yourself with an ability to hover but with an ability to point the engine in a slightly unusual position Viffing was developed as a tactical manoeuvre by the United States Marine Corps when we found out what they were doing which was outside the structural envelope of the Harrier because the Harrier's nozzle control system was designed to be used at no more than 250 knots and if you stick those nozzles down into a five or 600 knot airflow then the mechanism that is pushing them out into the airflow um, comes under great strain and so we had to strengthen the ch operating change and do other things to the linkage to make sure that we couldn't break the aeroplane if they were to wave the nozzle lever about in combat, they the Marine Corps. Now, some people in the design office said, well, all you have to do is to put a prohibition on using the nozzle lever above 250 knots. I said, that won't work. You know, a, a combat pilot is going to do whatever a combat pilot 
can in order to win a combat. You've got to be realistic. We must make that nozzle lever marine proof. Well, by the time the Falklands happened, all this had, had all long been done. And so the Royal Navy pilots had the ability, if they wanted to, to viff in a flight. But they didn't get into those sort of fights for the sort of reason I mentioned. And so viffing was not a factor in, in the Falklands War. Were there any lessons learned, obviously, from the, the operational use of the, Harrier, the Sea Harrier down in the Falklands, when, when, back with yourselves at all? I don't think the lessons were with Hawkers, or British Aerospace as it was by then, with the aircraft company. I think the lessons were all with the Royal Navy and the MOD. They realised what they needed was an airborne early warning radar aeroplane. It used to be the Gannet when they were flying their Buccaneers and their Phantoms. So they had no radar cover that was, if you like, over the horizon looking at what was coming. All we had was what the ships had down on the surface, which is very limited in how far it can look, and what the Harriers themselves had. We badly needed an airborne early warning radar to, to manage the fight and the interceptions and so on. A um, bit like the chain home stations in the Battle of Britain, you know, they were fundamentally managing uh, limited resources. Well, the Royal Navy pushed into service very quickly after the war, a Sea King with a huge search water radar on, in a sort of dustbin-like device on an arm. But it wasn't there in time for the war. So I think that was the biggest thing. It's no good having fighters on board a ship if you haven't got some airborne early warning. And what is your opinion of, of the um, role of the Harrier in, in the Falklands War? Do you believe it was a pivotal role that it played during the war? Well, if you talk to the Admiral that led the whole thing, he, he said... Without the Sea Harrier, we couldn't have sent the task force. And he meant by that we would have had no air cover. None whatsoever. It isn't a case of whether the Harrier is good or bad at air cover. At least you had something. Without it, we, they could not have dared to send a task force. After the, the war had finished, you, you were still chief test pilot. Um for a period of time, weren't you? What, what were you involved in in that, that period? The, there were two things. There, were, there was the upcoming new version of the Sea Harrier, which became the FA-2. I had very little to do with that. That was after my time. Um, and this was the improvement to the radar and improvement to other equipments in the aeroplane. Um, and then there was the big programme, which I was out in the States on, uh, during the Falklands War uh, that I mentioned earlier um, where we were doing this AV-8B which then for the Marine Corps which was a big wing big plastic wing um, 230 square foot area instead of 201 square foot uh, lighter because it was made of carbon fibre carb carbon epoxy um, material um, there was this development program which was a considerable program the Royal Air Force had a version of that aeroplane called the GR5 and then the GR7 and then the GR9 and these 5, 7 and 9 and the two seater equivalents of uh, the T10 and the T12 all have this big plastic wing um, so well, that was going on but my work finished at the end of, well, beginning of April 83 when I turned into a pumpkin when I became 50. Uh, by then, <clears throat> we were looking at an updated version of the Hunter two-seater to have this new radar that was going into the FA-2 version, a much better radar than the original one. The Hunter couldn't manage this radar. It was too much for it. And so we modified a uh, Hawker Sidley 125 aeroplane and put the radar in the front of that and had a lab in the back. And uh, so that was the equivalent aeroplane that Taylor and others used to develop the FA-2 version of the of the aeroplane. 
When you'd reached 50, is that, were, were you, were the restrictions on you being a test pilot at that stage? Yes, I mean, when, <coughs> excuse me, yes, when, when I jumped, when I joined um, the company as a civilian test pilot, the mandatory retirement age was 45. That was the um, the age at which the company said, thou shalt retire and take your pension and all the rest of it. When I got to be 45, I made the case for carrying on until I was 50, assuming I kept my medical standard, and um, I was able to succeed with that, but only... Um, with agreeing that when I got to be 50 I wouldn't make a fuss again sort of thing and, and that I was quite happy to do. Um, Colin Chandler was our MD at the time. Now Sir Colin Chandler, uh, he ran defence export sales after he left British Aerospace. He now is the chairman of EasyJet and so on. Um, wonderful guy, uh, an inspirational leader and, um, and those people are few and far between. Um, my definition of such a leader is that not only does he have these natural leadership qualities that we can all recognize, but he doesn't waste them by not talking to and accepting the advice of his staff who are specialists in certain areas. Some inspirational leaders think they know it all and they don't want to listen to anybody else. Well, Colin Chandler wasn't one of those or isn't one of those. So he said to me when, when I was negotiating with him to carry on to 50, there were two or three things I wanted, and he said yes to all of them. And um, I said, and he said, but when you get to be 50, I don't want you to make a fuss again. And I said, okay. And that, that was it. What did you, did you go on to do with the company after that period? They made me general manager of the flight test site at Dunsfold for a few years. And then I got moved on to the headquarters at Kingston, where I spent my last 18 months or so before I was made redundant in 1990, because Kingston and Dunsville were then shutting. And uh, they wanted me to go to Wharton. I didn't want to go to Wharton for all sorts of personal reasons. And so um, I was made redundant. That was probably what I was angling for anyhow. But I went to Kingston for the last 18 months or so of my time with British Aerospace, and I was working on potential future uses of the aeroplanes that we were then manufacturing. And in particular, I was looking at Hawk being used as a NATO military training aeroplane, which eventually it was. Um, so yes, I think my title was Special Operations Manager or something, some load of rubbish, you know, which is one of these non-dimensional titles that means nothing and, and allows you to get on with what you're supposed to be doing. And have you kept um, your interest in aviation and, and work in the aviation field since? Yes, I haven't stopped. Um, I had five or six years as a self-employed test pilot after I left British Aerospace. And I work for seven different organisations during that time and flew over 20 different types of aeroplane. Some of them were quite significant. I was the first Western test pilot invited by the Russians to evaluate the MiG-29. Well, could you tell me about that? Um, yeah, I mean, best fighter wing I've ever flown. Um, brilliant piece of kit. Um, and that just about says it all. Uh, no, that's... Uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful flight. I flew with their chief test pilot in one of their two-seaters. And um, it was... It was beautiful to see what really good aerodynamicists could do with a, with a fighter wing. I'm not suggesting we didn't have really good aerodynamicists at Kingston, although I have to admit, and I think they would be the first to agree, that they were nothing like the calibre of the MiG-29 and SU-27 aerodynamicists for a whole variety of reasons. Um, but w the, the Kingston people also had terrible constraints on size and weight because of the engine that was available to lift this thing off vertically, and so they could never get to grips with a wing of the quality that the MiG-29 had. And when airplanes are doing, when airplanes are flying normally and not on an engine, um, the wing determines, not surprisingly, how well they fly. And the Harrier has always been at a bit, a bit of a disadvantage with its wings. Um, but the MiG-29 wing. Now, what do I mean by best fighter wing? You could take it to a higher angle of attack and you could 
use the controls instinctively without the aeroplane biting you, stalling, spinning, going out of control or departing, as, as the, the word is these days. When somebody says the aeroplane departed, they mean it departed from control, whether it went through a stall or into a stall or into a spin is imitated or a tumbling maneuver. The general term it used is departure. Well, this MIG wing was as departure proof as you can imagine. And if you if you know how to do aerobatics in a tiger moth, and by that I mean you know which what you, which way you have to move your hands and feet to do a loop, a roll, a stall turn then take my word for it you could do it in the MiG-29 and, uh, and I just did a stall turn as easily as if I'd been a tiger moth and I have been an instructor at Cranwell on Jet Provost and one go in five I would mess up a stall turn in a Jet Provost and you say to Bloggs there you go you see Bloggs that's what happens if you don't do this and that right but no I mean the MiG-29 was just brilliant so the aerodynamics aerodynamics was so benign from the pilot's point of view that you could just use the controls in a way that was totally uh, unthinkable with United Kingdom or Western high performance jets at that time after the MiG thing uh, what other sort of airplanes are worth mentioning uh, the Israeli Levy which was uh, another very interesting airplane this is one of four aircraft in the world that are the same aerodynamic configuration as Eurofighter um, the current Typhoon um, the Israelis were the first to experiment with this configuration the, the Swedes were second with the Gripen and um, the French were third with the Rafale and uh, the Eurofighter was fourth with the Typhoon and uh, I went out to Israel I think it was 91 anyhow it was 10 days before the shooting started in the first Gulf War and everybody thought I was crazy to go out there but it was an opportunity to fly a really advanced aeroplane which um, I wasn't going to turn down and that I did um, I flew the T-45 Goshawk which was the McDonnell Douglas version of the Hawk for for the United States Navy I was asked to go to the States and look at that um, the other end of the scale I was flying aeroplanes like the CN-235 uh, a civil and military transport aeroplane like a twin engine Hercules about three quarter scale Hercules but with two engines ramp at the back you know that sort of thing um, high wing couple of large turboprops um, I was flying the Optica um, a, a reconnaissance aeroplane that uh, was being developed by FLS at that time at Bournemouth um, various other aeroplanes um, most of which were not worth talking about but it, if you are a professional test pilot what what interests you is the test program that needs to be done it isn't a case of it's not interesting if the thing doesn't fly at Mark II 50 feet upside down in the middle of the night. Any time you get into an aeroplane, whether you're going to test it or just use it, you can kill yourself. And uh, you can kill yourself if you make a mistake and the aeroplane can kill you if the wing comes off or whatever. So professional test pilots have the greatest respect for all aeroplanes and it's got nothing to do with their maximum speed, which is what most people think. So I, I flew a lot of general aviation airplanes in that time and so on and um, I think probably the program that gave me the most satisfaction ever in my whole flying career was not the Harrier but the CN-235 out in Indonesia and that may seem um, a funny thing to say but um, one of the problems with being a test pilot on the Harrier was that if you had a point of view and you wanted to make a change to the aeroplane then you wouldn't necessarily be allowed to do it money might get in the way office politics might get in the way the not invented here might get in the way all of these things now I have to say that nine times out of ten 
because of the quality of the relationship between Kingston and its test pilots, we got our way. But nevertheless, there was a lot of frustration in the program at times. The, the effort you had to make to argue for a change and so on, which seemed, the reason seemed self-evident. And then you had to go to the ministry and get the money and all that. When I was doing the CN235 program out in, out in Indonesia, it was a modest enough aeroplane, didn't go faster than about 250 knots. But I was in total charge of the whole program for three months. Anything I wanted to do was done. Anything I wanted was paid for. Any change I wanted to make... In other words, I wasn't just the test pilot on the program. I was the program manager. I was in charge. I had an authority that, in my view, was commensurate with my responsibility. When you fly a Harrier, you have a lot of responsibility to bring back this very expensive piece of kit and not break it and so on but you often don't have the authority that commensurate with that responsibility once you're on the ground again uh, you can normally get your own way in the air but um, on the ground you um, yeah so, but it wasn't like that in Indonesia and so for me as a as a sort of uh, contract test pilot um, it was a brilliant experience and I really enjoyed my time there and since ending your period as a contract test pilot, have you kept your hand in? Other not, not really. Um, I, I occasionally fly in multi-career airplanes. I don't have a license now from a medical point of view. Um, I haven't done any real test flying now for a couple of years. Um, and, uh, you know, that's it. I'm 74 now, so what sort of thing? Um, you know, you've got to give up sooner or later. Um, yes, no, I had a good time. Very good time very interesting period in aviation awful lot going on and I feel in many ways quite sorry for the youngsters uh, today doing the job that I did because they don't have so many opportunities to them uh, available to them but then of course they only know what they know and so you don't miss what you have no experience of really and wandering around an airfield at Farnborough in 1950 and seeing 106 different types of aeroplane you know, that was how I started my career, and um, I wouldn't, uh, I, I don't think it could have been better in any way, shape or form than it was. <laughs>